Julie Mugford was Jeremy Bamber's girlfriend at the time of the tragedy. She came from a working class background and at the time was studying to become a teacher at Goldsmiths College in London. As Jeremy came from a more privileged background, Julie must have felt she'd done very well on the social scale as she was dating the good-looking, intelligent, wealthy and public school educated Jeremy Bamber. As time went on, Julie became very unhappy in her relationship with Jeremy and towards the end of August 1985, she had realised that it was just about over between them. When Jeremy's friend Brett Collins jokingly announced she and Jeremy would be betrothed, Jeremy said he would not be getting engaged to Julie. Brett believed Julie wanted a commitment from Jeremy, but Jeremy did not feel the same way. In fact, Julie disliked Brett intensely because of the strong friendship between him and Jeremy. Bearing in mind that most of the case against Jeremy Bamber was built on Julie's claims, it's unsurprising Julie showed considerable spite and anger towards him in her December statement. She stated that by 1st of September 1985, I would really love to hurt him and told him that I tried to stab the teddy bear that he had given me as a present, followed by, we didn't sleep well and at one point I got a pillow and put it over his head. I took it off and he asked me why I did it and I said if he were dead he would always be with me. The end of Julie and Jeremy's relationship came after Julie caught Jeremy talking to another woman on the phone. Jeremy had been planning to start a relationship with someone called Virginia and this made Julie furious. In a fit of rage, she smashed a mirror by throwing an ornament at it, then physically attacked Jeremy. Crucially, on the 8th of September 1985, Julie was charged with burglary at Whitton Police Station. However, the Director of Public Prosecutions advised Essex Police that the charges should be withdrawn and Julie Mugford would be required as a prosecution witness. In fact, Julie went straight from Whitton Police Station to the police training school in Chelmsford where she made statements claiming that Jeremy had told her he had hired a hitman called Matthew MacDonald to kill the family for £2,000. This contradicted her previous statement of the 8th of August 1985. Matthew MacDonald was later found to be totally innocent. Not only had Julie Mugford's story completely changed, but also she claimed her telephone call from Jeremy was at 3.12am and not 3.30am as stated on her original statement. This is crucial as it would put Jeremy's call to the police after his call to Julie's and not the other way round. Julie also now claimed that Jeremy had mentioned many times that he intended to kill his family and yet according to her she did nothing even after the killings were carried out. Discrepancies appeared with Julie's statement at court. Julie claimed the hitman had told Jeremy who had told her Neville Bamber had been shot seven times. Neville had in fact been shot eight times. It was the newspapers that reported it was seven times. The jury became unconvinced by Julie's testimony and were unable to reach a verdict. They asked to see the evidence of the blood in the sound moderator and when they did, they found Jeremy Bamber guilty by a 10 to 2 majority. David Bowflower and other beneficiaries of the Bamber estate had discovered the sound moderator at White House Farm three days after numerous police had thoroughly searched the property. Before the trial, various newspapers with offers of money had approached Julie for her story. She instructed a solicitor months before the actual trial to negotiate a deal with the highest bidder, which was the news of the world. They paid for Julie to be put up in a hotel and paid a cool £25,000 for her story upon a guilty verdict. Had Julie signed the contract before giving her evidence, she would have been in contempt of court. The fact that she arranged this contract pre-trial did not break the letter of the law. Having posed for photographs in her underwear and smiling for the camera after the trial was over, Julie states she spent the money on an apartment. During the 2002 appeal for Jeremy, both Julie's solicitor and the News of the World claimed they no longer had a copy of the signed contract. 
and yet Julie's statement to Metropolitan Police suggests she did have the opportunity to read the contract. I clearly skim read the contract and missed a lot of the detail. Today, I read all of the small print. Most of us would interpret this as on the day she wrote the statement, she read a copy of the contract, but the CPS argued this is not what she meant. Paul Close of the CPS states, the witness is clearly saying that in 1986 she skim read the document, but today, as she is no doubt older and wiser, she would always read the small print. I read is clearly in the present tense and a general observation. She is not saying, today I have read. The CPS maintains that the contract was not in existence in 2002 and that it could not be established when Julie signed the contract. Indeed, Julie herself says that she couldn't remember when it was signed. In 1987, the Press Council ruled that the News of the World had broken their declaration of principle on checkbook journalism. Anyone can see that the media interfered with the judicial process as Julie's deal was signed upon a guilty verdict and she made a lot of money out of it. By 1991, the City of London Police had investigated Essex Police and they detailed a list of crimes which Julie had confessed to carrying out undetected. These included taking cannabis, selling cannabis, accessory to burglary at the caravan park, smuggling drugs back into the UK from Canada and checkbook fraud. Two of these offences were committed before she met Jeremy Bamber, or without his knowledge. During the 2002 appeal, it was discovered that Julie and her friend and co-fraudster Susan Battersby had likely been given immunity from prosecution as a trade-off for Julie's testimony against Jeremy, but the documents relating to this were under public interest immunity. The CPS had a file in their possession known as the Confidential Crown Prosecution Service File relating to Julie Mugford and trial preparation by Essex Police. The mystery remains as to what happened to the confidential file and what was in it. Is it right that the defence should be continually denied access to these materials? And what of Julie Mugford herself? Quite incredibly, D.S. Jones, the principal detective, saw her in this case no less than 32 times. Some statements were written in the third person and well below the expected standard of someone doing a degree at master's level. Grammar like Matthew Dunnett appears to fit someone rather less educated than Julie Mugford. Julie went on to live in Canada and in 2006 she took up a post as the vice principal of a primary school in Winnipeg. In 2012, she was director of assessment and instructional support services for the Winnipeg School Division, a post that she no longer holds. We leave you to draw your own conclusions on the reliability of evidence supplied by Julie Mugford.